Yeah. Um, and I have to know. <clears throat> okay, so on today's agenda, good morning, everybody, or afternoon or evening. Uh, we've got Hackfest planning for DC and Beijing. Uh, so Todd will update us in particular about the DC area, which we now have a confirmed host. And, um, uh, and then a uh, reminder on Beijing. And again, um, you know, we'd like to get a sense for who's willing and interested to help us with that, uh, both from a hackathon perspective and the Hackfest perspective. Um, <clears throat> Uh, quick update on the internship program. I believe that the um, uh, nominees were all supposed to get their uh, uh, their um, nominations in by last Friday. So Todd, you can update us on where we are with that process. And then um, uh, just as an FYI, we don't have to cover this more, the, the, the uh, proposals for the requirements working group charter and the Fabric Composer project, or the, I should say the Composer project, but we're both accepted by the email vote, so those will proceed. Um, and um, then uh, Dave um, Hoosby has joined us as our security maven, and so he's going to introduce himself and tell us about what his role is going to be. And then we have two proposals, one from Nathan George on Hyperledger Indy, and the other from Benjamin Ballin on Hyperledger Burrow. Um, and then um, if Tomas joins us, then we can also finish up the Q&A on uh, the GSL. And then next week, I've been away on uh, business travel and face to face meetings uh, pretty much since our last call. And so uh, I haven't had a chance to uh, to work on the sub project discussion, but I'll, I'll get to that. Um, uh, and we'll we'll discuss that next week. Any other topics that people would like to bring up? If not, then let's begin. Todd. All right, uh, Hackfest uh, DC area confirmed Monday and Tuesday, April 24th and 25th. I just dropped the registration link uh, into the window there. Uh, please register as soon as possible if you're planning on attending. Uh, also, we have a draft agenda. Um, it is sparse at the moment, but like all the other Hackfest, if there's topics you're interested in working on or things you're interested in learning, uh, please drop those suggestions in there. Uh, we'll work on getting that all mapped out uh, the morning of the first day. And then for Beijing, uh, Brian, are you on yet? Uh, he may be a few late. Uh, but the, the thinking remains the same for Beijing. Uh, LinuxCon uh, will have the first year in Beijing, uh, and for all of China, for that matter, this year, June 19th and 20th. Uh, during that, we're going to have a Hyperledger track running. Uh, but the thinking is the June 17th, 18th, the weekend before, to run a hackathon. Uh, and then follow that up with a Hackfest uh, June 19th and 20th in tandem with the Hyperledger track. Um, so wanted to right. and, and go Todd, ahead. Just to remind people that what we're thinking of for the hackathon is not your typical contest to Correct. write an app or something like that and come up with some cool blockchain solution, but rather to actually be, uh, you know, looking at Jira, finding bugs or issues that can be triaged and worked on and uh, contributed as, as change requests or pull requests as the case may be. Um, and then we would spend the Hackfest time basically going through those and reviewing them and merging them or, or you know, engaging the, the contestants as, uh, as appropriate. Um, so it's really more of something to sort of engage and get people to consider uh, contributions and um, again, to sort of help uh, grow our our technical community in the in the uh, Asian Pacific land. Yep, exactly. Uh, any questions there on either Hack, uh, DC Hackfest or Beijing? All right, uh, moving along quickly. Internship program. Uh, we did have about forty students apply. Really happy to see the response there. Uh, the next step, we are going to be setting up uh, a meeting with the six mentors to review all of the applications that came in and hopefully get those finalized by the end of next week. Uh, and then we can move forward into the work on that. Um, and then Chris, you did the FYI on the two things that passed. Uh, and that brings us to Dave. Dave, are you on? Yes, I am on. All right, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, hi. Yep. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I guess it's me, huh? 
So um, we sent out a media, uh, email to the TSC mailing list yesterday to introduce myself. I am the new security maven. Um, I've been on board now for about three weeks. Um, I'm not going to repeat everything in the email. Um, basically, you know, I'm really excited to be on this project. Uh, I bring along a lot of experience in open source um, to what we're doing here, and I am just well. Anyway, you guys can read the email. I don't want to waste your time. We can move on. Um, if you ever want to contact me or have any questions or anything about security or about just software development processes, give me a call. My door's always open. I'm based out of Las Vegas, so that's the Pacific time zone. But like the rest of you, I pretty much work around the clock. So <laughs> um, thanks for the warm welcome emails that I got from everybody. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks, uh, welcome. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or? Well, hi, Dave. This is Leonard. Um, yeah, I, thanks. Um, welcome to the team. I am new myself, and I'm learning a lot about blockchain. But you seem to have a keen interest on identity. So I take it you're working very closely with the identity team to formulate, to formulate yeah. and framework and requirements. Excellent. Yeah, um, I might lean on a few of you to bring me up to speed on the big issues on identity. But yeah, my one of my main focuses right now is solving the identity problem. Um, I was talking to Brian last the last couple of days about how I think the identity problem is where all of the other applications overlap. You know, like if you want to work in, in say bank, you know, like stock trading, you have to identify yourself. If you want to work in, uh, you know, interface with healthcare records, you have to identify yourself. So um, I think getting a truly good story or stories, I don't think there's necessarily one right answer. Um, having that in our back pocket anytime we talk to people um, is going to be key to the success of all of the applications of, of the technology that we're developing. So um, I have part of the other reason I have a keen interest in it is because I've been working in personally or privacy enhancing technology for about 10 years now. Um, before joining this, before joining Hyperledger, I worked at Mozilla on Tor browser issues, and I've been in the Tor community. Um, I'm also involved with the Human Rights Foundation, and so I've typically been focused on end user privacy um, and how to properly handle personally identifying information and things like that. So, um, my involvement or you know my interest in the, the identity problem um, will definitely be colored by that perspective. Um, how can we create a good, solid identity solution that doesn't become the central point of surveillance and uh, human rights abuses, you know, right? That's a real big challenge. How do we give the end user total control over their information, really? So, yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, welcome on board, and we look forward to your contributions. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thank you very much. And um, speaking of identity, the next topic on the agenda is actually to um, review and discuss the proposal uh, to contribute uh, Project Indie. And hopefully we have one of the um, proposers on to share that with us and we can maybe be started on um, our first identity project. Jarman, are you on to, to make the proposal? Yeah, so actually I'm here. Um, uh, this is uh, Drummond Reed from uh, Evernim and the Sovereign Foundation. And uh, I'm here in the same room with uh, Nathan George, who many of you met at the last Hack Fest, and also uh, Jason Law, uh, who is a CTO at Evernim and chair of the Technical Governance Board um, at Sovereign Foundation. And so the two of them are going to do most of the, uh, of the talking here. Uh, we're just using my machine for efficiency. Okay. And if you want a fast present presenter over to um, my machine, I do have some slides up that I can show. Rather than pass it to Drummond, if you pass it to Nathan George. I yeah. I think I'm listed as Nathan George. Let's see. Yep. Uh, uh, I'm only seeing Drummond in there. Nathan George. Uh, oh, he's going to type his name in. 
So I'm I'm, I'm click not yet because Nathan's oh, gonna okay. do it. There he is. Yeah. There you go. Got it. All right. So in the project proposal description, um, this is the description out of the project proposal document. Um, so the Sovereign Foundation has been working on creating a, a global public utility for identity. And that consists of a lot of different pieces that are required to make it so that we can anchor an identity out in a public space that everyone can use that can be compatible with multiple different ledgers and different applications. Um, the idea is to make an identity system that anyone can add an identity to and then allow all sorts of different systems to interact with so that you can make it attestations and create credentials based on different identities within the global network of identity and then you can leverage and use those identities inside of other systems. Um, so when we talk about a ledger that's purpose built for identity, there's a few things that are really important to remember and to consider. Um, the first is to make sure you keep all of the identifiable information off the ledger while still keeping the ledger available to anyone in order to anchor and put an identity out on that ledger. So there's a few techniques that are important for doing that to re retain privacy and to make it so that there isn't correlatable information that's out in the public. The first one is we use a system of pairwise identifiers and the second one is that we anchor things to the ledger rather than publish any sort of encrypted data. Um, various other ledger projects that are involved in Hyperledger like um, R3's Corda and also Fabric have different approaches to doing that where they can share transactions and information amongst private parties. But because the, the identity system in particular needs to be compatible and checkable by anyone, um, we have a bit different approach there to make sure that any identity can be validated and can be compatible across any of the systems that needs to be used for. Um, and then we have some careful consideration of for not putting information on the ledger that isn't supposed to be public or shouldn't be publicized. Um, the second thing that is really important to think about is that you need to have a system for interacting with these identities that's contextual, meaning you only expose the parts or information of your identity to the, the parties that it's relevant to. Um, so instead of publishing that information on the ledger, we use pairwise identifiers that are published on the ledger. And then when you go to see where, how to talk to one of those pairwise identifiers, you talk to something that we call an agent that can present the parts of the identity that are relevant to that particular identifier. So you end up with mutual authentication between those two agents where you know what their pairwise identifier is and they know what your pairwise identifier is. And then you can present attribute-based credentials um, to the parties that are involved in those interactions. Um, and we've designed the, the credential system or the information exchange system um, in, in a way that preserves the privacy, not only in terms of presenting information that's signed with those pairwise identifiers, but also in terms of being able to revoke the different kinds of credentials and attributes that you've shared in a way that preserves privacy as well. Um, there's some links that I have both in the project proposal document as well as in this slide deck, which I'll share out um, later today on the thread for the project proposal that go through first the ABC for trust model, which is something that Jan Kamenich and his team at IBM have been working on that um, we draw a lot of inspiration from in terms of how our credential system is put together, as well as uh, a paper that was published by our cryptographer at Evernim, Dmitry Kuzmenko. Korvatovich. Korvatovich, excuse me, um, who uh, has put together the system for doing revocation in a privacy preserving way on top of the, those credentials. Um, the other piece to point out to this group, I think especially, is that this identity model is, is really designed from the beginning to be interoperable. It's very small and thin, um, and those identifiers are meant to be something that can be used in a lot of different places and wrapped with a lot of different kinds of compatibility. Um, and the system itself makes no decision about whether the information is correct or with, whether it's trustworthy, because a lot of that depends on whether you understand the semantic meaning of the schema that's being presented. And it also depends on who, is, who it is that's attesting to that information. And so relying parties make their own decisions about what entitlements they're going to grant and whether they're going to trust the information that's been exchanged. So what this gives you is it gives you a system for making sure the right person is saying the thing that needs to be said 
and then you can handle anchoring um, the identities that you trust and managing the entitlements that are associated with those credentials or those pieces of information that are exchanged within whatever ledger system or within whatever identity system uh, or with, within whatever transaction or um, um, validation system that you're, you're already using. So there's a few tools that are used to accomplish these things. Um, you've heard us talk before about decentralized identifiers in the DID spec. Um, this is a specification that we have been advancing not only with Indy and the project that we're doing here at Sovereign, but it's a specification that we're working to make other systems where they're doing identity in the permissionless ledger, ledger space. Um, the Uport folks that are working on top of Ethereum are working towards this specification, as well as the folks that are working on top of Bitcoin with Blockstream and Blockstack are also working at supporting this DID spec, which is something we've been advancing with those folks and working with them on for quite a while. Um, we also have a, the system for verifiable claims, which I mentioned before, and here's the links to those. The links to those two papers that I mentioned earlier are here. Um, it goes to the technical details on how we create um, claims and then also how we create proofs that are, are based on those claims. And the proofs that we build are, zero, are capable of zero knowledge proofs. So we can do selective disclosure on any of the, credit, or on any of the verifiable claims that are exchanged between identifiers. And what this creates is it creates a system where we can um, establish information that can be used to authenticate or to exchange or improve information required for transactions. And then we can selectively disclose and share that information in order to participate in transactions as needed. Um, and then, of course, we also mentioned the idea of an agent, which is the part of the system that runs on behalf of an identity that makes it so that we don't have to put any um, identifiable information on the ledger itself. Um, so once you get an identifier, you can validate that the keys for that identifier are correct. And then we have a system for creating service endpoints inside of the, the, the payload of the DID or the decentralized identifier that allows you to look up where those service endpoints live. And then you can talk to that service in order to, um, to query it for what types of services it provides and what it's able to support. And then you can interact directly with that other identity through that agent. Um, and the agent is also a very convenient point to integrate into multiple kinds of ledgers. Um, we have some projects where we've been working for with a use case specific ledger where they might be doing financial transaction settlement or another specific transaction type of interaction. And the agent allows them to both validate all the identities and then use the information that's exchanged between those agents and leverage it as part of that, those transactions required for transaction settlement. So um, it's a convenient point to integrate between multiple different ledgers and make it so that you can exchange information with strong, identif uh, with strong identification or strong authentication plus authorization. Um, so in the spirit of keeping things short, we're kind of just blasting through all this quickly and then we can handle questions and talk about whatever um, things are most interesting to the group. Um, Indy has various component parts. Um, in the last few calls, we've started calling those sub-projects. So um, the sub-projects at Indy um, there's, are there's a common library. Um, we currently do have our own ledger um, that's been purpose-built for identity. Um, as I've talked to folks in the past, we're not particularly tied to that ledger. Um, we're hoping that as things mature and go forward inside of Hyperledger that more integration opportunities come up and that there'll be an opportunity to integrate hopefully at the ledger level as well as in other ways in terms of making it so that the identity model we're using with Indy is, is fully supported in the other ledger systems. Um, but we have two parts to our ledger. We have the consensus layer and then we have the ledger itself and we're calling those out with the brand name of Plenum so that it's clear that the Indy identity model itself is could be made compatible with other ledgers. Um, we have the component that's called the anon cred component, the anonymous credentials component that, like I mentioned before, is um, where we do the claims and the proofs and a lot of the cryptography necessary to make sure we have a privacy preserving identity system. Um, we have the system that runs a ledger node, which is Indy node, which adapts Plenum for the transaction set that is required to support identity. Um, we have a component that manages what we call the reference agent. 
um, which is the agent that we expect anyone who wants to join Sovereign as a global public utility can go ahead and integrate with and start with. Um, this component is actually quite new right now, so there's not a lot of code in it quite yet. Most of the code for the reference agent is currently in the project we call Indie Client, which is really like the SDK or the library pack that allows you to interface with anonymous credentials and allows you to talk to both the ledger and also the other agents within the system. Um, and in addition to the version of the Indie Client that's written in Python, which matches some of the other code bases that we have, we have a new version of the Indie Client which is being written in Rust. Um, to be wrapped as a, a linkable library that any C callable programming language would be able to pick up and use in order to expose the same functionality that we're talking about in the Indie client component. So I think with that, I'll open it up to questions, um, and then we can use other slides in this deck to talk to any of those other points um, as you folks want to dive in. <coughs> so uh, this is Ripon. Um First of all, uh, we had, just to, just to keep a background, we had several uh, conversations on the identity working group with uh, uh, the sovereign slash indie folks. Uh, so uh, we are kind of aware of where they are with the various uh, initiatives and proposals, uh, but could you make clear what the separation would be between sovereign itself and Indy as a contribution to the um, uh, Hyperledger project? Um, as we mentioned before, uh, Sovereign is in, in, the intention of Sovereign is to be a global public utility for identity. So basically to take the Indy code base and use it to make a, a network for identity that would be useful um, globally across the entire internet. Uh, and the Sovereign Foundation intends to manage kind of the, the technical requirements and the trust framework requirements in order to make identity as a public utility. But Indy as a code base um, would be useful as, a, as what you might call a side chain or a side ledger to manage identity in, in any project that needed identity. Um, and we think that that would be useful both in terms of adding an identity component into an existing ledger that's focused more on smart contracts or on settlement amongst other types of transactions, or it might be very useful for some, some network that wanted to do identity but not at a global scale. For instance, if there was a, a country that wanted to do identity and make sure that identity stayed isolated to just that country, or a, a particular vertical or industry that needed identity without wanting to expose that identity globally, they could create a, a, a ledger or a network using Indy that they could use to accomplish that purpose of identity and then those identities would, of course, be compatible with a network like Sovereign because they'd be based on the exact same identity model. Um, and then also in terms of integration, we think that a lot of these components, these sub-projects, would be very compatible pieces with the other ledgers, um, meaning they, we could substitute out the plenum component if that was something that the other projects desired. So Vipin, this is, uh, this is Drummond. And, uh, uh, let me say a little bit more about the Sovereign Foundation and what uh, what that's about. So uh, Sovereign is an independent uh, global nonprofit organization that was set up exclusively for the purpose of providing this very thin governance layer for a public permissioned ledger. Um, so that the, the what we're submitting is the Indy code base was a code base developed to support that ledger. And you just heard from Nathan, you know, all the other things that we believe it could be helpful in supporting. Um, one of the reasons the Sovereign Foundation joined um, uh, Hyperledger was because of the synergy we saw, not just on the code base, but with the you know, the goal of, of creating this uh, you know op st industry standard open source uh, uh, software for powering uh, uh, blockchains of any kind, you know, uh, whether private permissioned or in our case, this sort of you know unique area of public permission. So the goal of the Sovereign Foundation is to run that public permission ledger, I mean, to govern it, to, to provide the trust framework. So it has a, a board of trustees, 11 trustees, I'm one of them, um, has a couple of working groups to set up that governance. The trust framework working group just published the, uh, uh, the first version of the trust framework for the network. Uh, I'll put the link into the, into the chat. And uh, um, so it's, you know, and, and ultimately it's responsible for sort of stewarding and making sure that uh, the code base moves forward. And that is overseen by a, a separate board there called the Technical Governance Board. 
and Jason is the chair of that. And maybe he can speak for a second about the, the technical governance board. Sure. Um, we've got uh, a number of folks um, from around the world, mostly US, but we're um, wanting to expand that. Uh, we're, we're actively recruiting um, individuals to come, especially in security and privacy, uh, to help us. We've got a number of requests out right now uh, for some additional help there. We meet once a month. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, asynchronous um, back channel communication, and we do have a, a Slack uh, a Slack team uh, for Sovereign where a lot of this uh, has been happening. I'm not sure how that's going to transition with um, you know, if we're uh, joining Hyperledger, we'll have to transition that and, and do things a little differently there. But uh, yeah, I definitely, I'm definitely interested in getting involved. <laughs> sure. Yeah, okay. so right. So so Drummond and Nathan, this is Chris. Um, so I guess my question, and I, you know, I'm glad you brought up the working groups and, and sort of how all this sausage is made, so to speak, today. Um, because I think it's kind of important that we sort out as a function of uh, approving and and, and, and and incorporating, you know, the indie project into Hyperledger as to exactly how it will work going forward. In other words, if we have working groups that are deciding basically what goes into the open source software and it's being, um, you know, managed, you know, from a Git, Garrett, Jira, whatever, you know, perspective here in Hyperledger, you know, what's the relationship between the identity working group in Hyperledger and the various working groups and uh, at, at Sovereign? And is, you know, is membership in Sovereign a prerequisite to being able to participate in the working groups there? I, I don't understand how all this is <clears throat> uh, going to shake out. And, and, and I, I do think that it's kind of important that, um, you know, as a function of our review and approval that we do get a clear understanding about, you know, how, how these, you know, how Sovereign and, and Hyperledger are going to relate to one another in this context. I strongly agree, and I see Nathan sitting here nodding next to me. Um, in particular, we've been running our project like an it applies fully open source. Um, I mentioned we have some working group calls. Uh, a couple of our folks will probably be dropping off to go to those working the ledger working group call today, um, which starts at, at, on the hour. Um, anyone's welcome to join those. Um, our code is all on GitHub. It's under the Apache two license. Um, the calls that we have, we typically run very in much the same way that uh, the calls I've joined from the Hyperledger project run. Um, our intention is to move all of the development of Sovereign over to the Hyperledger Indie project underneath Hyperledger and do the development work there. Um, and then we will maintain the Genesis blocks with the public network of Sovereign within Sovereign, um, but then develop the code out in the open with the Hyperledger project because we think that that will both broaden the exposure and also make the code more useful to folks who have reasons to work at a, a smaller scale than at the global scale of identity. Um, so I hope that that answers part of the question. Um, and, and if I can uh, answer, uh, Chris, the sort of the other part of your question about um, you've got sort of two bodies uh, governing or, or, or working on a code base. Um, and we, we have thought about it quite a bit and actually discussed it with uh, uh, Brian Bellendorf. Um, and the way I say working is actually quite clean, which is the code base is under uh, Hyperledger. And as Nathan just said, you know, it's open source, it's, it's a meritocracy. Um, the Sovereign Foundation and specifically the Technical Governance Board will have certain uh, requirements for the sovereign network uh, that will be reflected in most cases in the trust framework. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll put the link in the in the chat here in just a minute. Um, and basically it's a customer of, of that code base. And it's like, hey, to do the following things that we think are, are necessary for, uh, you know, for the operation of the sovereign network, which is what will be one instance, running instance of, uh, yeah, of Indy, uh, we need the following things in, in the code base. Um, if if we ever got to the point where there was a conflict between that and what was required for Indy, um, you know, I think we'd tackle it, but we don't foresee that's going to happen. Um, there, those, those, there may be features of Indy that are not used by other implementations or other ledgers that use it, 
Um, but I don't think the, the features that would be required by uh, the Sovereign Foundation for the Sovereign Network are going to conflict. Um, so it's essentially it's one customer of that code base. We believe the code base will be much stronger for the Sovereign Network um, as well as for anyone else to use it if if we're doing this, uh, you know, combining forces and doing it under the Hyperledger umbrella. Right. This is but, fine. If I can, if, if I can just add, I, I see in the long term it kind of looking like the difference between, um, say, ICANN. You know, uh, if we're talking about DNS, right? It's like the difference between ICANN and the IETF and uh, people like Paul Vixi <laughs> who are implementing DNS software. You know, a lot of overlap in personnel between these three buckets, <clears throat> but uh, kind of distinct, distinct roles. And um, I. I, I, I think in the long term, everyone works together and benefits, but uh, um, I, that's that's how I see the relationship between Sovereign and uh, Hyperledger uh, and, and Indy. I guess, but Brian, I guess the, the thing that concerns me is if somebody comes along and wants to contribute to Indy, let's say, or to one of the sub projects of Indy, that we have some clarity as to how the sausage is made so they figure out how to engage. If they need to sort Absolutely. of- all you of know. that has to happen at, at Hyperledger the same way that it has to happen with other projects, right? So um, right. the right. transparent right. development practices and and the, you know, having that community run that, that process and making it multi-stakeholder, all of that has to still happen with Indy. It, Indy can't take its lead from Sovereign, right? Um, uh, or be be driven strictly by Sovereign's demands, absolutely. And I, right. think, I think everybody on the call agrees. Yeah, we all agree with that. Actually, let me also make it clear. It goes the other way as well. Any um, Hyperledger participants, be them individuals or, or organizations, who want to get involved with the uh, what the Sovereign Foundation does, which is, you know, again, this governance piece of a global network, we welcome you with wide open arms. Uh, we would love, you know, anyone who's interested in that, any, any uh, you know, corporate entity or individual uh, at Hyperledger, We'd love to have that participation. You know, we're we're building a global utility for the internet, and uh, you know, the more uh, involved, the better. Um, again, several of us are we're all volunteers at Sovereign Foundation. Uh, I'm actually a trustee, but um, we have uh, the full support of the Sovereign trustees. They just met last week, and we're very enthusiastic about um, um, you know this this contribution and the relationship with Hyperledger. Right, but I, I think what I'm sort of asking for, though, is to have some specificity in the proposal that specifically describes how there's a there's a how to section in the efforts and resources. And I think, you know, there's mention of these working groups that talks about, um, uh, you know, the ledger and the agent and the trust framework. It, are those working groups specifically coordinating the development of the sub projects of indie slash uh, Evernim that are um, uh, that that should come over into Hyperledger so that the technical community that's building them can do that and that there's another group in Sovereign that's providing input into the set of requirements and so forth. I just think that that needs to be mapped out so that we can make um, an informed decision and, 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 and or, you know, to tweak that as needed to yeah. get everybody in terms of the working groups that we have right now, um, we've been trying to have as few working groups as are, are necessary. So we have a working group that we call the Ledger Working Group that handles the aspects related to the nodes and running of, of the node network. And then we have a group that we call the Agent Working Group that handles the off-ledger portions of the system. Um, we have uh, all of our tasks and tickets right now are being managed out of JIRA at Evernim. And one of the things that we're excited for is the idea of moving those out into the open and making all that more accessible and more public. And then um, I would expect that we would manage the workload for those different sub projects um, much the same way it's man being managed at Fabric right now. Um, I think we have some things to learn about how we want to do that to help drive community participation. And certainly that's actually one of our motivations for joining the Hyperledger umbrella is we, we expect that some of the support infrastructure that's available with Hyperledger will help significantly with that, um, as well as we have some things that we need to learn about trying to make sure that those processes are sufficiently open. Um, there's not any resources right now that are hidden. Um, most of the discussion about what the requirements are and what we're, what everyone in the community is trying to accomplish right now is done in those working group calls. 
Um, so you're certainly welcome to join and participate there. And um, we're hoping to make that process more transparent and um, more accessible to everyone. So Christopher, this is uh, actually more I think about it, you've, you've highlighted something that we listed in there, the working groups that were going on right now. So we were basically saying, here's all of, here's the code and here's how we've been working on it. Um, yeah. You're correct that the proposal didn't turn around and say, and here's how we propose this should work when everything is in, you know, what working groups should transition to become Hyperledger working groups. Right, uh, right, yeah. right. And, and so I, I think that's a very good point, and I think we'd be super happy. I don't think it would take very long um, if whatever subset of folks, if we can identify right here in the call, who should we work with to basically say, all right, what's the best way for this work? I mean, obviously with Brian, but is it with yourself? I mean, we've certainly talked, we've, we're now very active in the identity working group. Um, and it's interesting, Vipin, because uh, the identity group working group has is, is not had, uh, you know, so far, to my knowledge, a ledger that was specifically about identity. So it sort of gives a an additional um, uh, weight or focus to the identity working group within Hyperledger. Um, but in any case, whatever set of folks you think should work with us, we can get together, figure out how that should best work, and then update the proposal to reflect that. Um, do any of you have any uh, ideas or comment, quick comments on that in terms of how that's being managed, either in Fabric or in uh, Sawtooth Lake? in terms of what the difference between a, a working group and a project would be? Well, for, for, the, for the most part, I mean, the, the working groups that we've had that I, would, I guess you would consider to be formal working groups would be like we had an SDK working group for Fabric that is, is really more of a, uh, it's part of a sub-project. I mean, all, there's all these F SDK pro projects and there was a coordination mechanism between them and they ended up writing a spec to ensure that all SDKs sort of had the same um, capabilities, um, even though they're, you know, different languages and different implementation um, uh, frameworks and so forth. And so, um, uh, and, and, I, and I think, you know, for the most part, the working groups are more of a meta thing for the most part than specific to a project and the projects you know, the way that they coordinate is through mailing lists and, you know, the, the rocket chat and, and, and an occasional call. Um, uh, and, and again, you know, Brian, we, we've gone through, you know, and, and tried to sort of transition from being focused on telephone calls to one where we're a little bit more focused on getting things done through um, asynchronous mechanisms like the mailing list and, and or chat. Um, so that people can engage when they can engage, um, and um, and 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 again to make it all you know sort of you know fully transparent and recorded so that you know we can also you know engage people around the globe that aren't able to participate in phone calls simply because it's at one in the morning or something. That makes um, a lot of sense. Um, in fact, our working groups right now do a lot of their coordination on what, on the Sovereign Forum. And I expect the transition most to mailing this would be a really good idea. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think getting the tickets right now that uh, the cataloging that we've done internally out into the public JIRA repository will help with that. Um, and then we do most of our coordination right now on the Slack channel for the asynchronous communication. So I think that that, that feels really good. Um, we may want to propose a couple of the working groups that are at Sovereign right now as working groups underneath Indy. Um, but I think we probably, we might want to play that by ear for the next yeah, while. Yeah. It, it sounded to like the way, that, the way that I heard you describe the the working groups. It sounded more around the operational aspects of the ledger or the you know the client, and the agent, or the trust framework, and less about here's what we're going to develop. Although maybe the trust framework is a little bit more of that. But if we could transition the parts that sort of pertain to the active coordination of what code is going in and not going in and and what are the priorities and so forth for the project here in Hyperledger to Hyperledger itself and coordinating with the identity working group and so forth, but have all the, you know, issues go into JIRA, have the code in, uh, you know, the Hyperledger GitHub uh, organization uh, or Garrett, uh, again, depending on how you want to do your reviews, and to transition 
mailing lists that are specific and pertinent to the discussion of how this, you know, uh, coordinating what we're doing there and creating the appropriate channels in Rocket Chat that, uh, you know, again, so it's essentially lifting and shifting, if you will, the parts of what is going on in Sovereign now that coordinates about what India is and moving that to hyper. If we can just identify what those things are, I think that, and, and Brian, you know, you, you, you know, you feel free to, to weigh in on this and David as well, um, you know, as, as, as to, you know, how do, how do we sort of, you know, get these things? And then I do think that there probably does need to be some, um, you know, some form of description of how we envisage going forward that Sovereign and Hyperledger, as pertains to identity, will uh, continue to, to operate. Chris, um, I, I, I know where you're coming from. I, I just don't want to overload this. Sovereign should be thought of as just another um, consumer of the technology. Right. Um, uh, and have the same kind of relationship. Uh, well, I mean, they're a member they joined, um, but the same kind of relationship as any vendor would or any other user of the technology would. Um, certainly they're putting there are people with uh, kind of a sovereign name badge putting effort in the project and we want the project to be multi vendor. But um, there's every I, I fully expect that that team will uh, know how to separate the development and management of the sovereign trust chain using indie technologies from the development of indie as a common platform for other people doing the same thing. Um, there's no reason to treat them, I think, differently or especially in this regard. Yeah, and I agree with both the comments that Chris made and that uh, Brian just added. Um, it's just a matter of enumerating how we want to break it down into the, the rocket chat channels and, and mailing lists. Um, I don't think that that um, is at all a showstopper, and I think that that will be a fairly straightforward thing um, with what we have going on. Um, okay. I can call out with more detail what each of those working groups is currently working on. Um, I, I think maybe the titles are a bit ambiguous, but they do have some very um, specific requirements that they're working through and, and some deliverables in terms of what it is that they're each trying to, to accomplish right now. Um, so I think that that's a fairly straightforward process. I don't think that that, that doesn't seem like a, a stopper at all in my mind. Okay. Hi, this is Lennox. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is all wonderful. And so, Chris, I think, and uh, there's a lot of hope from everyone. Um, it's great that we have a project uh, like MD being incubated into Hyper Ledger. Um, I guess it's, it's not an incubated project just yet, eh? it's a proposal to bring it in. So, it seems like definitely we have to clarify what all the requirements for incubating a project of this nature with Hyper Ledger because there are aspects that we need to focus on in terms of, say, accountability, decisioning. And I say decisioning, it's a broad statement which will cover requirements, reported, shared responsibilities. How do we make changes to the code base if the sovereign team, in its own right, in its own domain, have requirements for changes vis-a-vis -vis, um, the maintainers within Hyperledger for the same code base? So will it be shared? Will it be successful? Will it eventually diverge into two separate code bases? So these are some of the things we need to grab this right now to ensure we have a clear understanding between the two parties. And I mean the sovereign campaign or your main and the team and anyone who gets incubated with Hyperledger to maintain um, the same code base or <laughs> different code spaces. Who knows? Oh, all right. So change management is going to be very critical going forward, and we are going to have it in projects of the same nature. So yes, although we think it may be simple, but I think we need to look at everything so we can dot eyes, cross these, and make it very clear in terms of how the chain of responsibilities and accountability will be maintained for a project of this nature, which, is a, which seems to be a very wonderful expansion for Hyperledger to have this sort of identity component um, brought in. But we need to make sure it's clear to everyone so everybody understands responsibilities and how they are shared and accountability. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you, Leonard. Um, we have a lot of those resources for calling out what, what direction we're trying to take the code um, and uh, tickets and some a lot of resources internally, especially in terms of documentation and design documents, something that we often call a plan of attack in terms of how we're 
accomplishing a, a, a new requirement or a new feature. Um, some of those are not very transparent to a newcomer. Um, and I'm hoping that moving to Hyperledger will help give us some resources to make that more transparent. And then also if we normalize some of those processes relative to what some of the other projects are doing, I think it will also help perhaps some of the cross-pollination of ideas. So this is Drummond, what, uh, I, this is all excellent input. Um, what are your specific, uh, uh, what, what are the suggestion for the, the, the TSC about how we should move forward? Are the specific areas that we should uh, uh, try and revise the proposal to add clarity? Um, should, should we have a dedicated call about it? What, what are you suggesting? Um, well, Brian, we can have a vote, and if the TSC is comfortable with sort of just dealing with this as sort of the normal project, you know, how do we set ourselves up? I think that's fine. Um, again, I was I was just concerned because it just sounded to me like a lot of the um, sausage was being made someplace else. But if if that's not the case, then that's fine. I I, I think everyone is committed to making sausage in public um, okay. at the appropriate place. Um, my, that's my sense, and I, if uh, we're not at there yet, then we um, should have another conversation for a week. These are important issues to work out, no doubt. Um, and I, I um, perhaps I'm coloring this with um, the fact that I do know these individuals well and feel like uh, they are on the side of right <laughs> um, on all the same things we are aligned with. Um, but it's, I, I know that's a learning curve and a relation curve I've already climbed and others haven't. Um, and we should absolutely make this based on the, the, um, the, the, the statements made and, and kind of common consensus as well. So don't want to rush it. Uh, but I, I feel like um, I, I feel like every every one of these is something that we can and should be addressing as a normal part of uh, building the project. Well, let me, let me ask this before we take a vote. Let me ask: Are it, it, are members of the TC? Are any of the members of the TC that still have um, uh, questions or would like to see more clarity, um, refinement, or are we ready for a vote? So, anybody who has remaining concerns or remaining questions uh, and wants to see more uh, you know specificity on this aspect or other aspects please speak now or forever hold your peace and then if we don't hear anybody then I guess we can ask Todd to take a vote this is Dan I, I don't have concerns I just wanted one clarification um, could you say again the the uh, definitions for Indy and plenum so I think I've heard Plenum used to describe the, the ledger and the consensus mechanism and maybe something that was going to be left behind in Indy would be the things coming forward. So if you just kind of clear that up for me, that'd be great. Sure, this is Jason. Uh, Plenum is, uh, we, we built Plenum separate from Sovereign um, from the beginning because uh, there were clearly uh, requirements that were general uh, ledger uh, requirements and general consensus requirements and you know it felt like um there's actually quite a an opportunity for domain specific ledgers using plenum um there's a lot of innovation happening uh, obviously a lot of innovation happening around uh, consensus protocols and ledger technologies in the hyperledger project and that's not where we want to focus a lot of our energies um, we want to focus on identity and so the expectation is that um at some point in the in the future there will be a um, uh, uh, either uh, an enhancement, um, a, a concerted effort to enhance uh, plenum or um, a shift to something else. So calling it um, the Indy consensus um, when, when uh, the Indy project is not uh, long-term dependent on plenum um, felt like uh, going too far. And so keeping them separate um, to kind of differentiate where things are really dependent and where they're not was the idea behind separating the name. So to add maybe one more comment to that, um, the intention is to bring Plenum with Indy into the Hyperledger project and to have all of them inside of Hyperledger. And then we're making careful effort to call out that um, Plenum is an area where we expect convergence between different Hyperledger projects over time. Is that plenum as a, a ledger or plenum as consensus? 
So plenum is separated into two chunks. Um, we have the consensus protocol, and then we have the ledger. So it sounds like to me we have to separate these areas of responsibility and the different components that will make a tight ledger as opposed to uh, remain in sovereign so that we all understand accountability and all the different responsibilities. And it's a very good move, but I think we need to go high especially ensure there is that clarity and transparency in how this whole thing will operate going forward. So, okay. Yeah. So there are a few subcomponents there, um, so I know it'll take some time before folks are, are familiar with and comfortable with kind of how it's decomposed. Um, but it, I think it's sufficient to say that um, plenum right now is the le is the ledger piece that Indy uses, um, and it consists of both the consensus algorithm and the ledger. And we're intending on bringing everything, all the code that is currently um, due, due identity, we're bringing all of that code into Hyperledger, not some of it. Okay, thanks. Oh. So I, 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 I would prefer to see that, that this project, Indie project, is a proposal for identity, as an identity project that does not depend on any ledger underneath that. It seemed to me that, you know, the, the architecture is that way, but, you know, probably the, in, the dependent on plenum is now built into some of the components. So I, I would prefer to separate it out into two different project proposal, plenum as a separate project, uh, so that it play the role as you know the, the blockchain ledger or, or blockchain technology as part of the core hyperledger project, and then identity as another top level project that is independent, that built in such a way that it's independent of, of plenum, so that. It gives other projects like Hyperledger Fabric or Sawtooth Lake um, a, 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 an, an equal and fair chance of being able to integrate and make use of um, Indy uh, the same way as it's being integrated uh, with Plenum. So, so um, Ben, I, I, my, um, I, I, this goes back to I, identity as a service that we can all use. Or, an, or identity as a capability we can build in and support on. Um, you know, what I see the proposal is right now is step one is give us an identity service that we can all use. It's a separate, distinct identity service that we could all use. It happens to be built on distributed ledger, but it has some really interesting features that will allow us to express much more um, uh, identity-specific policies and the transactions and and uh, the semantics that we have. That's step one. Breaking it out into independent capabilities can be incorporated in, to me, as a later activity. Yeah, this is Dave. I, I would second that, um, that idea. Uh, when we get to step two, I smell a really great opportunity to start having a, I don't know, move, moving forward the interoperability conversation that's already taken place. Um, and uh, it will give us an opportunity to like tackle an actual implementation of can we make Indie run on top of Sawtooth Flick? I think that would be a really interesting project to entertain. Well, but but that means to me that we are building an application now, right? Indie well, is an application, even though yes, yes, I mean identity is important for hyperledger project, but. Indie itself is an application in my mind on top of a ledger technology. Um, so if, if we say that our, our core mission is to support projects that is building a ledger, right? Like such as, such as Sawtooth Lake, such as Fabric, such as uh, Iroha, um, then, then this project doesn't fit that core mission. This project to me it is an application. So the so, one comment I, I would have to that Ben is, is that I could see the um, need to have a fabric identity system be decentralized. So if there were some way to integrate, um, uh, you know, if this was if this was a platform in which that could be achieved, I would be highly interested in that. So Indeed, that be and uh, I, if I say this quickly, architecture becomes an overriding um, set of importance here to ensure that 
the component fit uh, for identity um, within all the different uh, hyperledger projects. Yeah, so really there are quite a few things that need to be addressed. Uh, part of which is architecture, architectural concerns, and the approach going forward to make it a successful, you might say, marriage between ND and our hyperledger projects. Okay, in, in the interest of time, uh, kind of uh, re up Brian's call for a vote. Any remaining concerns? If not, we have two minutes, probably time for a vote. All right, Todd. All right, running through uh, Ben. Uh, I, I think I need more time on, on this, so I'm abstaining at this point. Okay. Uh, Chris? Yeah. Dan? Yes. Greg? Yes. Hart? Yes. Mick? Yes. Morali? Yes. Richard? Yes. Tamash? Yes. All right, that's eight, four, one abstain, that passes. Thank you. And, and Ben, I do believe your concern is valid and we should find ways to make sure that this can be an overlay and work with um, uh, all of the different DLT engines out there. And my, when we talked about this at the Hackfest, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I sense that was a sincere focus of the uh, developers proposing this as well. So um, uh, your your concerns are heard loud and clear. Hi, this is Robin here. We are just really thrilled um, to uh, um, you know to be to be part of this. Uh, we I want to say we found everything uh, about our interaction with Hyperledger from the very start, um, and and Brian's reception to be. Fantastic. Uh, Nathan and I, the last Hack Fest was uh, a real pleasure. So we're just really, really um, uh, excited and passionate to move forward with everyone with this. And uh, uh, we look forward to just, you know, integrating as fast as we can. Uh, it's, it's thank you for the timing. We're literally going to go over to the Hyperledger, I mean, to our own Ledger working group and go, guess what? <laughs> uh, we're we're going to try to be transitioning all that over. So Thank you very much. Please uh, uh, excuse the fact that we need to drop now ourselves, um, but uh, I'm really excited to do this. And uh, Vipin will obviously work with you uh, on, uh, <clears throat> you know, how, how we'll uh, uh, be integrating further with the uh, identity work. Okay. No. Thanks, Drummond. Thanks, uh, Nathan and team. Um, and uh, we're at the top of the hour. So unfortunately, we didn't get to um, the other two agenda items. Um, and you know what, Tomash, um, if you can join the call early next week, then I think we'll put you first. And then second, we'll have um, the, the other um, project proposal. Right. And we can, uh, that, that, uh, again, that way we aren't just bumping everybody week after week. So um, uh, thanks, everyone. And we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks. Thank have you. a good day, everyone. Have a good day, everyone. Really appreciate it.